Good morning. As Rob mentioned, this is our last Sunday in this portion of our yearly theme on rejoicing. Coming from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the idea of rejoicing always, and at the center of that thought is joy. Joy is a concept that is all throughout the Bible. In fact, the word joy and some of its synonyms are used at least a thousand times in the pages of the Bible. It's clear when we read that uh, and see how frequently this concept is brought up in the Bible, it's clear to understand that God wants us to experience joy in this life. Have you settled for less? He wants us to experience a joy that is both full, not just part, not just a little bit of joy, but he wants us to experience a joy that is both full and continual. The idea of rejoicing always. It should be something that always characterizes us. I'm reminded in Luke chapter 2, specifically verse 10, when to a few shepherds an angel of the Lord appears And he said, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. Jesus' birth into this world and kind of moving from that as a beginning point, looking at the things he taught, the example he left behind for us, what he accomplished in his death on the cross and the power of the resurrection, all of that together, it was to be good news of great joy. What Jesus did in his life and accomplished in his death and resurrection is a source of joy, and it should be for all the people of the world. Everyone can rejoice in what Jesus did. We should take joy in Jesus and in our God. How do we do that? How do we take joy in what Jesus did? How do we have that that's continual, that isn't just for brief periods of time? Well, I want to focus our attention this morning in John chapter 16, specifically verses 16 through 24, is there's a statement there that Jesus made. And throughout the lesson, we're just going to break down this simple uh, statement by Jesus that now you have sorrow, therefore you have grief right now, he says to his disciples, but your heart will rejoice. And he's talking about when he dies, they will have sorrow, they will be lost, they will be scattered, They will not know what to do with themselves. He says, but when I come back, when I'm resurrected, they didn't understand what he was saying, but this is what he meant. When I'm resurrected, you will have joy. And then he finishes by saying, and no one will take that joy away from you. I will give you a joy that will last, that can endure the grief and sorrow that this world has to throw at you. And it's a joy that no one can take. Only you can forfeit it. But no one can forcefully take it from you. No circumstance can pry it from your fingers if you are holding on tight to the joy that I am offering to you. So we want to look at that statement in John chapter 16 this morning and just evaluate what Jesus meant when he said, I give you a joy that no one can take from you. But first of all, he acknowledged that they were going to experience some grief and they were in the midst of it. And this tells us if we're going to understand what this joy really is, it might be helpful to understand what it is not. Sometimes when we think of joy or rejoicing, it's if you don't have a big smile on your face, grinning from ear to ear and talking in in a nice soft tone and as if there's no problems in the world, that if you're not like that, then you don't have joy. No, that's, that's not the case. Joy can coexist with other emotions. Joy can exist in the midst of trials and heartache, and hurt, and pain. This is very much what we talked about the last several weeks in going through the book of Lamentations. Two weeks from now, we'll finish in Lamentations poem five, but I wanted to take advantage of of one more lesson on joy, as this is our final Sunday in this portion of our yearly theme. But in Lamentations, his present reality, and, and for all the inhabitants, the survivors uh, of what happened in Jerusalem, that present reality is suffering, pain, grief. But in chapter 3, the third poem, great is thy faithfulness, and, and I have reason to hope in you. And there's something to lift him out of the pit. But again, poem 4 and 5 are still pretty dark in their tone. The grief and sorrow didn't immediately go away, but even in the midst of it, the poet still found a cause for hope. Still found, even if you will, perhaps 
a little bit of joy in God, even though his present reality has not changed. He's still suffering. He's still grief-stricken and full of sorrow. But even there, he could find a little bit of joy. And so that's this first statement here. The joy which Jesus speaks about is not the absence, the complete absence of all negative experiences, trials, or emotions. It exists in spite of those things and even consistent with those things. They, they coexist together. Jesus made that promise just a few verses later. Chapter 16 and verse 33, he says, In the world you have tribulation. It reminds me very much of, of some of the first teachings of Jesus. The Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. You go to the Beatitudes and Jesus says, If you mourn, if you are poor, destitute, you are blessed. You see how that's almost saying that you, you have a cause for joy even though your, your outer appearance, your exterior is, is one of lowliness, is one of sorrow or mourning. You are blessed because in God you find comfort. And at the end of the Beatitudes, Jesus promised them, you are blessed even though for my name's sake people are going to be cruel to you, say horrible things, mistreat you, abuse you, harm you physically. So Jesus doesn't sugarcoat things for his disciples or for us today. He says, in this world, you are going to have tribulation. He says, I'm not promising to take away all hardships from you, and that's how you can have joy. I'm not promising to give you millions and millions of dollars and make your life a, a life of ease and comfort, and then you can have joy because your life is so comfortable. He says, no, in this life, you're going to have tribulation, but I'm going to give you a joy. At times... Joy is what we see on the surface. I think particularly in praise, we should be rejoicing, and that should be what's on the outside. But even at times when sorrow or frustration or hurt is what's on the outside, Jesus is promising us that joy will still be there, protecting and guarding our hearts, keeping us from losing all hope, keeping us from being devastated to the point where we give up. He says, you'll still have joy even on, when on the outside, you're surrounded in a world that is full of tribulation, hardship. Not always fun, not always easy, not always comfortable. But this joy will exist even in those circumstances. <clears throat> the joy he promises us will exist even in the worst of circumstances. Jesus himself is a great example. In Hebrews chapter two, uh, sorry, chapter 12, verse 2, I know I've shared this illustration with you before. But maybe you can relate. Sometimes you read something in an article, hear something in a sermon, hear someone relate a story about a Bible verse, and then every time you come back to that verse, you go back to the, the illustration or the thing you heard. And, and that's the way it is for me with a lot of scriptures. In Hebrews chapter 12, my mind is always drawn to something that had a, a, a really big impression upon me. When I was in California, the, the preacher there, he liked to, you know, kids would draw pictures for him, little kids at church would draw pictures for him, and and then he put that as the first slide in his PowerPoint. And the kids would just, they, they just got so excited when their picture was the one he would choose. And they felt like they were part of the sermon that day. And Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The picture that comes to mind that was used in the PowerPoint was a very crudely drawn illustration. Of course, it was a child, but it was of Jesus, little more than a stick figure of Jesus on the cross. But the thing that was so profound in this illustration that just was completely missed by, by the child who drew it was that Jesus had a smile on his face on the cross. I guarantee you that was not the reality. Jesus was in pain agony shame it's a horrible experience but there was something profound about that child's drawing that resonates with this verse and i always remember that even though that was what was on the exterior of jesus it says there was deep within him a joy that kept him going on that kept him enduring that kept him progressing through this horrible experience because there was joy even in that though that wasn't what was on the surface that's not what you saw on his face but there was joy even on the cross for Jesus. And we look at the apostles, 
And, and, and so I just want you to understand that I don't want you to feel like you failed to, to, to rejoice or to, to rejoice always or to have joy in your life just because you experience the full spectrum of emotions. That's being human. The apostles, I believe they understood this concept of having a joy that no one can take away, yet they all experienced emotions. I'm going to focus on Paul because we have the most, um, you know, epistles preserved uh, that, that were written by Paul. But I think this is true for all the apostles. But, but with Paul, he experienced anger. In Acts chapter 23, he said he had a clean conscience, you know, he might have been misinformed or, or not really doing exactly God's will, but he always felt that he was doing the right. His conscience was always telling him, you know, you're doing the right thing, even if he was wrong. And for this, it says in Acts chapter 23 and verse 2, the high priest Ananias commanded those standing beside him to strike him on the mouth. And I don't know, verse 3 has always struck me as a little bit of anger, and I can't blame him. Paul responded, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. And do you sit to try me according to the law and in violation of the law order me to be struck? He's got a point there, but I don't know. I sense a little bit of anger on Paul's part. God, God's going to strike you back. You're, you know, uh, there was certainly fear. Second Corinthians chapter 7 in verse 5. I, I love that Paul is humble in writing these letters, honest, even vulnerable at times. You know, they, they looked at Paul as, as writing these weighty and intimidating letters. And I think Paul is trying to dispel some of that. He says, I, I've suffered a lot. I know he's defending his apostleship in this book. But 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 5, For even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. We were afflicted on every side. Conflicts without, fears within. Paul said, I was running for my life most of the time. I'd preach somewhere, and, and when it was time to leave was when they were trying to kill me. Paul usually left somewhere because his life was in danger. And Paul admits, I was afraid at times. Uh, there was sorrow. Romans chapter 9. You know, Paul, again, was a man who, who understood and had joy, and a, a, a joy that could not be taken away, that was anchored in Christ. But even still, he had sorrow. Romans chapter 9, he talks about his fellow countrymen. <clears throat> he says in verse 2 of Romans 9, um, I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ, for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He says, I, I have unceasing sorrow. This is something that was never going to go away. Anytime Paul thought about his countrymen, his brothers in the flesh, his fellow children of Israel, anytime Paul thought about them, it brought him sorrow. That was never going to change. But that doesn't take away the fact that he also had a, an unceasing joy in Christ. You see how they were able to coexist? This isn't a sorrow that broke him that broke his spirit and made him and drove him away from the Lord. This was a sorrow that was deep, but the joy is what kept him afloat. So I just wanted to point out, and, and also he'd write to the, um, the church in Corinth back in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 11. He says, I, besides all these external things, all these trials, all these afflictions, the way my body has been scarred and damaged and harmed physically, there is the intense concern for all my children in the, in, in the Lord. He said, who is led astray without my intense concern? Paul had worries and concerns just like you and I do. Parents have concerns for their children. That doesn't mean that you don't have joy necessarily. They can coexist. So I just wanted to point this out that the first statement Jesus makes is, you have grief now and nothing's going to change that. You're going to be sorry. You're going to be sorrowful when I die. The world's going to rejoice because they're, they're going to think they won. Satan's going to think he won. And the world's going to be happy to be rid of me. You're going to be sorrowful. But that's all right. From this sorrow will come a great joy. So I just wanted to make this our first point to understand what we're not talking about. To be people who have a joy that cannot be taken away. To be people who are characterized as rejoicing always. That does not mean 
that we can't show other emotions. However, it does mean that in our heart, there is a part of us that is guarded, that is safe, that is protected by this joy. We might have sorrow, but we'll never be broken by it as long as we have this joy. He says, your heart will rejoice. Uh, and, and this was something incredible to read. Go to Luke chapter 24. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 41, it's incredible to read the, the reactions of, of Jesus' disciples upon seeing the resurrected Savior. We know Thomas, we know his reaction. I, I need to see, you know, the scars on his hands and on his side where he was pierced. And when Jesus showed up and, and his reaction, my Lord and my God. You know, immediate, immediate. We know that they all reacted with joy and excitement and disbelief, though. In Luke chapter 24, notice verse 41. Well, they could not believe it for joy and were marveling. Jesus appeared to them and he would go on and ask for food. We know he's not some ghostly apparition. He's a physically, actually resurrected person who needs to eat food, but I just love that it says here, they, they couldn't even believe it because of their joy. They were so excited to see Jesus alive that it was one of those too good to be true kind of things. They couldn't even believe that this had happened. It's kind of like when you're a kid and you open the present and you can't even believe that you actually got that thing you asked for and you're just in a state of disbelief at first. That's the kind of joy they had and that's what Jesus promised. You'll be sad when I go. You'll be full of sorrow and grief when I'm gone, when I die. But when I return, you're going to have this joy. That tells you about the power of his resurrection. And the power of his resurrection is still a great source of joy for us today. Really, if, if Jesus hadn't been resurrected, what reason would there be for us to even gather here every day? We have a hope in resurrection, and, and God promised us that, that when we die, we'll go to heaven if we're faithful, and yet Jesus died and, and couldn't even be resurrected, so what hope do we have? See, without the resurrection, we don't even have any hope. This is our source of joy right here. Now, back in John chapter 16, notice again verse 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Very closely related to joy, in my opinion. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. So how do we have joy? We've already talked about what it is not. It's okay to have other emotions. But where does this joy come from that is kind of like an anchor of our soul that keeps our heart guarded? Well, I think this comes from understanding the power of the resurrection. That's how it worked for the apostles. When they saw the resurrected Savior, they couldn't even believe it. They were so ecstatic. That's the power of the resurrection here. And what it tells us is we're safe. We are safe to put our trust and hope in Jesus because the world did its best. It took its best punch at God and he just walked it off. Uh, spoiler alert, I hope everybody's seen the newest Star Wars by now, but there's that scene where where Luke Skywalker is facing all these gunships, you know, just by himself. And they start blasting down on him, shooting all their, their weapons at him that they can. And it's, it's definitely overkill. And there's a smoke-filled crater. And, and as the smoke dissipates, here he comes, unscathed. And he just kind of brushes himself off like that was nothing. That's what Jesus is saying here. The world can do its worst. They can kill me in the most shameful and, 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 and painful way possible. And he says, you know what? I won. I overcame. I beat death. I beat sin. I beat the devil. I didn't have to try very hard. That's where we have joy. Because we're on his team. He has overcome. He won. We just get to be on his team. It's kind of like in, you know, the playoffs in basketball right now in the NBA. There's, there's, some, there's some guys that are riding the bench don't even play a minute in the playoffs, I guarantee you on, on whoever wins the championship, there's going to be someone who probably didn't even play a single minute in the playoffs on bottom of the death chart. But they get, a ride, they get a ride the pine all the way to a championship and get a championship ring. That's like us. Jesus did the work. 
You know, these players on the bottom of the bench, they're, they're going to practice every day. They're, they're doing their best, <laughs> but it's the starters. It's the star on the team. It's, it's, the, it's the all-star players that, that did the hard work, and they, they get the championship too. And that's kind of like us with Jesus. He won, he overcame, and he's victorious. And he says, this world can't beat you down for good. You're going to have sorrow. You're going to have trials. You're going to have, you know, times where, where you're angry or frustrated. Emotions will get to you. But don't worry about that. that. There's going to be joy because I've won and you can win too. Another source of joy to the disciples, another reason for them to have this joy was the promise of knowledge. In verse 23, and in that day, you will ask me no question. They, they were puzzled all throughout this. Uh, and if you remember from our scripture reading uh, before the lesson, when Jason read through this text for us, Jesus understood, hey, you guys want to ask me some questions. You don't understand what I, what I meant, do you? <clears throat> but he says, you're going to have joy in that day because you're going to understand what I meant. If you go back in this chapter to verse 5, let me read a few verses here. But now I am going to him. This is verse 5 of chapter 16. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? Because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper shall not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer behold me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Again, there's Jesus' victory right there. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. He goes on to say, but when the Spirit comes, the Helper, he'll guide you into all truth. I think that's what he means when he says in chapter 16, verse 23, when I appear to you again and you've got joy, you aren't going to need to ask me. You aren't going to be puzzled by what I meant. There are things I couldn't tell you because you couldn't handle them now, but then you'll understand it. There's a joy in seeing the plan. There's a joy in understanding that God is in control of it all. I know it's perhaps over, an oversimplification to say the Holy Spirit guided the apostles into writing all the truth in the Bible and it's preserved for us, but that's true. And when you don't spend time in the scriptures, when you go days on end without opening the Bible, it's not just that you're robbing yourself of facts and information, you're cheating yourself of the joy of seeing God's wisdom. The joy in seeing what he's done for you and how he carried out his plan. And, and the joy in knowing that God controls it all. I know, every sermon I try to find a new and creative way to tell you the same thing. Read your Bible every day, but there you go. You're robbing yourself of joy by depriving yourself of the scriptures. One final reason in this text that shows what would be their source of joy, they would have a mediator. Let's go back to verse 23. <clears throat> and in that day you will ask me no question truly truly I say to you if you shall ask the father for anything he will give it to you in my name until now you have asked for nothing in my name ask and you will receive that your joy may be made full do you see the connection between having a full joy and then having Jesus as our mediator to ask in his name until now you have uh, sorry verse 25 these things I have spoken to you in figurative language. An hour is coming when I will speak no more to you in figurative language, but will tell you plainly of the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will request the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came forth from the Father. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. He's trying to tell him plainly, but... Boy, that's a beautiful statement. And that should, that should keep you going, even in the darkest of times, even when other emotions are maybe on the surface. Knowing that Jesus is our high priest, knowing that he makes intercession for us, knowing that as 1 John chapter 1 and chapter 2 tells us we have an advocate with the Father, someone who's pleading our case, someone who takes our, our, our very requests to the Father himself. 
You know, a couple Sundays ago, I did a lesson on the significance of dreams in the Bible. And we talked about Jacob's ladder and how in John chapter 1, Jesus said, you, you will see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus is that bridge between heaven and earth. He connects us to the Father. What a wonderful cause for joy. And so these are the reasons why. I think first and most importantly, the resurrection. Jesus said, I've overcome the world, and so can you. They wouldn't be puzzled anymore. Jesus said, there's a lot of things I want to tell you, but you just, you can't handle them now. You're not, you're not ready to hear the things I have to tell you. But you're going to have joy when you get to see it all, when the Spirit reveals everything and guides you into all truth. And you're going you're gonna to have joy when you can ask freely anything of the Father in my name and know that I am your mediator. That's how we can have joy today. And this is supposed to be a joy that no one can take away from us. This means continual. This means permanent. This means that only we can forfeit it, but no one can steal it away from us. No circumstance, no matter how challenging this life is. But there's a condition. In Philippians 4 and verse 4, we know these very famous, very well-quoted words of Paul. Rejoice in the Lord always. He isn't just saying, have joy. Out of nowhere, just suddenly be happy. Our joy has to be focused on something specific. There is something intentional about this command. There is something focused about this command. And it must be focused on the Lord always. If you want to have joy that, that can get you and carry you through any trial, if you want to have joy that no one can take away despite their best efforts, it's got to be joy in the Lord, connected to him. And sometimes people miss that connection. Uh, I could summarize this by our study in Ecclesiastes earlier this year. Solomon talked about people going from one high to the next, just trying to find some source of meaningful happiness in this, in this world. Relationships, food, money, prestige, alcohol, I mean, whatever it is, you know, people go from one thing to the next trying to find a little bit of happiness and it never lasts because those are maybe temporary spikes of joy, but they're disconnected from the source. I was reading an article about joy in the Bible and, and the author of this article told an interesting story about how post-World War I, Lawrence of Arabia took his men to uh, Paris and among all the um, you know, beautiful sights they could have seen, in their hotel room, they were just turning the water on and off, filling the bathtub and being amazed at how, just how much water they had access to. And, and it just came from nowhere. And as it was time to leave, they were, he caught them trying to remove and take the faucets off. And why are you doing that? We want to take these with us back to, uh, back to Arabia. There's not much water there. And we want to take these with us so we have all the water we could ever want. And so they had to explain to him, it's, it only works because it's connected to a great source of water. Joy only works when it's connected to God. And so, you know, we can chase after these temporary things. You ever try that zebra stripe gum? The flavor lasts for 30 seconds. And after about two minutes, it's like chewing on a pencil eraser. It's terrible. That's the joy that this world has to offer you. Little, little moments that was nice, but then it's quickly over and you're looking for the next little bit of joy. But when we focus our joy on the Lord, that's where we find meaning. So if we're going to have this joy, if we want the kind of joy Jesus promised, we've got to fix our priorities on him and align our will, our dreams, our ambitions with his will. The disciples... Why were they so heartbroken? You know, back in Luke chapter 24 and verse 21, there's those two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and they seemed so downtrodden. We really thought, we really thought that the, this Jesus was the one who was going to, you know, restore Israel. But you could just hear the disappointment in their voices. We really thought this was the one. In John, uh, John chapter 21 and verse 3, Peter says, I'm going fishing. And we go fishing because it's a fun hobby, because it's a good way to kill a Saturday morning and maybe catch a fish or two. That's not why Peter was going back fishing. 
He had given up the calling of Jesus to go fishing for men to go back to his old trade. He didn't know in the aftermath of Jesus' death, he didn't know what to do with his life anymore, so he just went back to what he used to do. That's what he meant when he said, I'm going fishing. I'm, I'm going back to my old life. You could see the, the, the disappointment in Peter's decision to go back to his old trade. What was their motivation? That'll tell you why they were so heartbroken. That'll tell you why they were so disappointed when Jesus died, because they were expecting the wrong things. They were wanting the wrong things. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 1, a common argument, a common debate among the, the apostles and disciples of Jesus, which one of us is going to be the greatest? Who's going to sit at Jesus' right hand? Who's going to be, you know, second in command in this new kingdom that Jesus is going to establish for us? At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? We hear that one all throughout the Gospels. And Jesus just couldn't get it through their heads. You see, their ambitions were not in tune with the will of God. They were looking for worldly prestige. Now, they were good men, and Jesus saw the potential in them. But at first, like pretty much every other Israelite, they were looking for a worldly kingdom. Matthew chapter 19. Do you notice the context here? In verse 23, Jesus tells how difficult it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Nearly impossible. Then in verse 27, it's important to notice that context. What Jesus just got through saying. And then Peter says in verse 27, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? Maybe you get a sense of their slightly skewed motives here. What's, what's in it for us? Isn't this going to be a great kingdom? You know, worldly kingdom? I think he's asking a little bit, what's, how are we going to benefit from this? What do we get out of this? Again, they were good men, and Jesus saw the potential and chose them for a reason, but you can understand why they were so heartbroken at the death of Jesus, because they were expecting and wanting the wrong things. When our goals, ambitions, and dreams are worldly, that's not a joy that's, that's going to last. That's not the kind of joy that Jesus said no one can take from you. Those dreams will be crushed. That's the nature of this world. But eventually the disciples learned. Mark chapter 10 and verse 43. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you've got to learn to be a servant to all. When they were first arguing about who was the greatest, Jesus was trying to get through this message. And I think after the resurrection, when Jesus said, you're not going to ask me any more questions because you'll understand it finally, I think they got it. And that's how they could have this joy is when they stopped arguing about who is greatest and they learned to try and be a servant. When they stopped seeking for that worldly kingdom, what, what's in it for us? First Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, your reward is reserved for you in heaven. A spiritual kingdom. When they understood that, then they had that joy. No one could touch. You see how they had to shift their dreams, their goals, their ambitions in life to now be in tune with the will of God? The same is true for you and I. <clears throat> if you want this joy, you've got to ask yourself, what is it that I want in life? Is it worldly things? Wealth? Comfortable life? living till I'm 100, then dying peacefully in my sleep, those dreams will be shattered. But if you want to be a servant to all and glorify God in your life, if you believe that when he said heaven is worth it all, and that's what you're living for in faith, that'll give you a joy that carry you through the worst times in this life. That'll give you a joy that no one will ever take away from you. That even when on the outside you might be crying, you might be angry, you might be frustrated, you might be worried, deep down inside, this will keep you anchored because your dreams are in tune with the will of God. There's a few thoughts as we conclude this portion of our year, our yearly theme, rejoicing always. I just wanted you to understand a little bit of what Jesus said there where this joy comes from, how we get it. It's, it's grounded upon his resurrection and the power of that resurrection. That's a hope we can have. Jesus overcame the world and so can you. Maybe your will, maybe your dreams and your ambitions are not in line with the will of God for you. 
you're going to be heartbroken, just like the disciples were when Jesus died. We thought we were going to get a kingdom out of this. They learned to kind of change their dreams and change their priorities. If you need to do that this morning, if you need help, encouragement, prayers, we're here to help you if you come forward as we stand and sing.